everyone, and welcome to Christiana Care Health System. We are so thrilled uh, to be hosting today's event as part of our Health Equity Series. I'm Bettina Tordy Rivero, so I'm the Chief Health Equity Officer and Senior Vice President for Government Affairs and Community Engagement here at Christiana Care. And at Christiana Care, we often say we serve our neighbors. Very simple but profound words. And we're committed to serving our neighbors as respectful, expert, caring partners in, in their health. And in doing that, we really strive to achieve health, optimal health, and an excep exceptional experience of care every time we care for somebody, for everybody we serve. And we str strive to do that in ways that our neighbors value, in ways that they and our community can afford. When we think about delivering health care and our commitment to our community, we believe, and we often say, and we're committed to, to a core principle that everyone has the right to be healthy, and to be able to access high quality health care. We know that each person's ability to be healthy is affected by where they live, by their zip code, their socioeconomic status, their background, their life circumstances. In Delaware, as in the rest of the United States, the significant disparities in health, care, in health outcomes unfortunately persist, persist. And they persist across demographics, including race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, disability, literacy levels, sexual orientation, gender identity, and neighborhood or zip code. Poverty, hunger, violence, lack of access to healthy food or transportation, these are all very, very real challenges that loom large in daily life for many of the people that we care for in our community. They make managing chronic illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, and other illnesses incredibly difficult for members of our community. They make it more likely that care, frankly, is delivered or sought uh, in the most acute setting, uh, where care is most expensive and where the outcomes uh, may not be optimal. And they increase the risk for poor health outcomes for many of our neighbors. So these are complex challenges, and frankly, they're magnified by threats to access to care. At the federal level, with persistent attempts to limit Medicaid, with unstable funding for providers, including community health centers, and now even at the state level with policy plans that risk access to quality care for our community and our most vulnerable residents. To address these challenges and threats, we must, we must work together, we must partner with one another, we must work to address disparities, to understand disparities in health and healthcare outcomes, to understand the causes of those disparities, and to work to eliminate them. We must partner with one another, but above all, we must be courageous, we must be relentless in our commitment to health equity for everybody, to protect the right of every member of our community to the high quality health care every person in our community needs and deserves. So today I'm delighted, humbled, and frankly honored to introduce outstanding partners in addressing these challenges and leading lights in the field of health equity to demonstrate their courage and relentless commitment to our community and our nation. So I'm very pleased to provide you a little background on each of our guests today. Dr. Jack Geiger is a true pioneer in the community health center movement in the United States. Dr. Geiger is the Arthur C. Logan Pre Professor Emeritus of Community Medicine at City University of New York Medical School, a founding member and past president of Physicians for Human Rights, which shared the Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize for Peace in 1988, a founding member and past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, the U.S. affiliate of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which received the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1985, and a founding member and past president of the Committee for Health in Southern Africa. Dr. Geiger was active in the Civil Rights Movement in the early 1940s, and after completing his medical training, participated in the Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1964. From 1965 to 1971, he was director of the first urban and first rural health care centers in the United States at Columbia Point, Boston, and Mountain Bayou in Mississippi. Most of Dr. Geiger's professional career has been devoted to the problems of health, of poverty, of human rights. He initiate, initiated the community health center model in the United States, combining community-oriented primary care, public health interventions, and civil rights and community empowerment and development initiatives, and was a leader in the development of the National Health Center Network of more than 1,200 urban, rural, and migrant centers currently serving approximately 27 million low-income patients. 
We also welcome today Dan Hawkins, Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Research at the National Association of Community Health Centers. Since Dan joined NACHC in 1981, federal support for health centers has grown from $350 million to $5.1 billion annually. And the number of people served by health centers has grown from 5 million to over 27 million. He's been named one of America's most influential health policymakers. And welcome. And finally, one of our great partners in the community, Lolita Lopez, President and Chief Executive Officer of Westside Family Healthcare. The partnership between Christiana Care Health System and Westside goes back many years and includes a really, I would say, a first of its kind partnership in Delaware that enables our Christiana Care residents to perform clinical rotations at Westside Family Healthcare, the largest nonprofit federally qualified health center in Delaware. And we really appreciate that partnership. Since joining Westside in August of 1990, Lolita, Lolita has successfully grown the organization. And I didn't know this fact, from a small one provider center with three and a half employees. <laughs> she was the half. <laughs> to today's joint commission accredited primary care medical home with five health center locations and one mobile medical unit providing services statewide. West Side's clinicians provide care to more than 31,000 patients annually and employ a workforce of, more, of nearly 250 people. Lolita is, is a member of several notable boards in Delaware, including our Christiana Care Health System Board of Directors. I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Lolita for nearly 30 years now. Yes, we go back to 1990. And I can personally attest that when she's asked to serve our community, her response has always been a resounding yes, I will do anything you need, whatever it takes. Lolita is a champion for health equity in our community, and with her colleagues, she makes a difference in the lives every day in the health of our neighbors. So it's my great honor to welcome Dr. Geiger, Dan, and Lolita today as we join in celebrating 30 years of compassionate team-based care at Westside Family Health Care. Welcome, everyone. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear my heart beating? <laughs> I think we all need to check. <laughs> I, can sure, I can sure feel that I got the doctor here, the good doctor next to me. So, um, in case something happens. So, um, thank you, Bettina, for that lovely welcome um, and introductions. And a special thanks goes to Christiana Care, um, to your office, who uh, so gracious, graciously agreed to sponsor this event, uh, to the uh, Office of External Affairs, to Dr. Janice Nevin, who's the President and CEO of Christiana Care. Um, our partnership um, is really valuable, and we appreciate your generosity in bringing uh, Jack Geiger here today. Um, I want to thank everyone in the audience who uh, took time out of their busy schedules today to join us for this special event. It's um, really exciting for us. This is a, our 30th uh, year anniversary for Westside Family Health Care. We're going to take the whole year to celebrate, so uh, we're going to have a number, a series of events um, that you will hear about. The, you, now you're on our mailing list, so um, hopefully you will be able to participate um, more than once um, in our celebration. For me, uh, 2018 marks the 28th year of my service to Westside Family Health Care, and it has been indeed a, an honor and one of the greatest joys of my life to be able to uh, lead this organization along with our amazing board of directors and to be able to really um, make a serious impact on our communities in the state of Delaware. But today I think my greater, even best honor so far is, is to be sitting up here next to my hero, Dr. Jack Geiger, um, it has been um, a joy for me to, to lead an organization knowing um, I'm following in some footsteps, some pretty, pretty important footsteps of our great visionary founder of community health centers. And I, I, you all hear uh, stories about how, how these health centers um, got started. But since my early years in uh, participating in what we call the movement, um, I've always known that um, these early issues around communities and improving communities and improving uh, the lives of people through things uh, other than health, the, the things that, that affect their health, 
health is really um, the, the really the pathway for us to really be successful in providing primary care. So um, before we get started, I'm gonna and if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm gonna quickly tell you a story about how I was um, so successful in getting Dr. Geiger here to Delaware. I had um, originally re reached out to Dan, who's a friend of, of Dr. Geiger's, about how can I get him to Delaware. Um, to help us celebrate our anniversary. And um, we talked about it, and um, a little bit later, I was doing um, a panel discussion for the, at the University of Delaware, talking about community health centers and the social determinants of health. And Dr. Geiger, I quoted you in my talk, as I do quite often, and, and the quote was, um, at community health centers, we have two kinds of patients. We have the patients that come in through the door and we take care of, and then we have the community. And I think that really sum summarizes um, our purpose as community health centers in serving. So I was able to do that panel discussion, and like all the other women in the room, after it was over, we were all lined up in the ladies' room. <laughs> and um, the serendipity that happened um, when a, a young woman, uh, Jane Walmsley, who's here in the front, Jane, raise your hand. She was standing next to me, and um, Jane said, uh, congratulated me on the talk, and said, um, I was a research assistant during my graduate studies with Dr. Geiger and um, I would like to I would love for him to come to Delaware and I said really I've been trying to get him to come to Delaware and she goes, well, I can make that happen <laughs> and by golly applause here he is. making that happen and, and the way she did that was she literally said I will go pick him up and bring him here and that's exactly what she did so um, without to make you know w without further ado I'd like to um, move to our program uh, Dan is going to moderate the conversation uh, with Dr. Geiger and um, we're going to talk for for a little while and then we're going to wrap it up and um, do a, a do a closing with with some awards so Dan great I take the panel. thank you Lolita good afternoon everyone good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I am so blessed and fortunate to be up here on stage with the gentleman who I consider our founding father our hero uh, our butt kicker in, in, <laughs> in chief who really truly uh, envisioned and then helped create and then helped run the first community health centers of the modern era here in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and sitting next to him, uh, I have some friends who refer to my wife in this term. I refer to Lolita in the same way. She who must be obeyed. <laughs> <laughs> She's my hero too. The chair of our health center advocacy task force at NAC who has whipped us into a mighty engine of advocacy and change. And so it's a, truly you. an honor uh, to be seated here up on the stage with both of you. So Jack. Yeah? <laughs> you've had this storied history uh, uh, and much has been told uh, over the years of uh, your uh, exploits and uh, an experience, but help us understand what was the tipping point? What was the trigger that drove you to make this your life's work? <coughs> Fighting for health equity, better health, um, an end to discrimination uh, in healthcare organization and delivery. Uh, what, what were the one or two factors that affected you sufficiently enough to make this your life's work? Well, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of uh, the way all of this started, at least for me, and the fact that despite all of these nice things that people have been saying, we all stand on the shoulders of others, and what happened to me really was that long before 
I had thought a great deal about medicine or a career in medicine or anything related to that. I cared about uh, civil rights and human rights and inequity and injustice and discrimination. These were uh, the things for a whole variety of reasons uh, that had involved me <coughs> at the very beginning and I was fortunate in having um, windows into uh, the black community and important people in the black community. Canada Lee, the first great black, uh, black actor of our time, um, and his son Carl, uh, living in a penthouse on Sugar Hill in Harlem, and stretching all the way to the folks who tried to teach me the jitterbug in uh, the Autobahn <laughs> Auditorium and uh, nightclub. And so I got to hang in a corner with Richard Wright on a secret visit back to the United States and Langston Hughes and a whole <coughs> spectrum. Vito Marcantonio, the radical member of the New York City Council, this is all way back in 1942 and three, uh, and that was uh, the beginning. Uh, civil rights work, inequity work, anti-racism <coughs> work, and uh, the like, uh, and exposure. Uh, to this whole other circle of life. It was going to be a while before it reached a tipping point. I had graduated, let's just trace it for a minute, I had graduated from high school, you know, we've got all of the science high schools and one liberal arts high school that you had to take a competitive exam to pass to get in and the one I went to, in addition to everything else, I did four years of college in three, and so I graduated when I was 15, and I had a regent scholarship to go to Cornell, uh, tuition free because of that, and in their wisdom they wouldn't take me, uh, so, because I was too young, and I just, hung out, and my life at that time was to be always a journalist and a writer, and uh, that's what I did when uh, uh, I finally got to the University of Wisconsin a year or so later, and in the meantime I had worked as a copy boy at the New York, at the New York Times lying about my age, <laughs> and uh, World War II, Pearl Harbor happened and everybody rushed off either to be drafted or to join the armed forces. And I had in the meantime somehow learned shorthand and typing. And in the space of about a month I became the secretary to the managing editor of the New York Times because there was nobody else around. Uh, and then went to Wisconsin uh, and formed one of the earliest chapters of CORE, the Congress of <coughs> Racial Equality, uh, and launched a campaign. I got into launching campaigns and turned out the university had approved, had a whole big approved list of off-campus housing leaving aside the fraternities and sororities, uh, other places, and none of them accepted black tenants, Asian tenants, Hispanic tenants, not many back then. This is, again, the 1940s. And uh, there was a campaign to be fought uh, against all of that. 
and I didn't think it was appropriate um, to join segregated armed forces, which they all were, uh, in World War II, and it turned out the National Maritime Union had cleaned up segregation for the deckhands and the engine crews, and it was possible to enlist in the maritime service as an officer and do the requisite training, and that was integrated as well, and that's what I did. Uh, because I couldn't see a way to fight Nazi Germany and racist Japan in a segregatory, segregated military. Uh, and another piece of good luck, there was one black captain in the U.S. Merchant Marine that had a master's license and always had but had never had a ship to command until World War II. Hugh Malzac, captain of the uh, Liberty ship, the SS Booker T. Washington, named without apparent uh, irony for the great champion of self-segregation, and <coughs> sailed on that ship for uh, a great hunk of the time that I was in the Merchant Marine. Uh, and so both of those events were w windows into another life. Uh, and uh, went to the University of Wisconsin and not everybody, I'm being long-winded, everybody was aware of where community health start, community health centers in their modern vintage started. They started in apartheid South Africa, of all places. South Africa had eight medical schools, all of them lily white. They didn't even teach much about the health of the African population. The Indian population in the Natal province, Indians from India, coming as, in effect, indentured servants um, and despite the fact that collectively they were 75% of the nation and the creation, the creators of most of its wealth. Um, not until 1950 was there a medical school for Africans and Indians uh, and some Malaysians. Uh, started in Durban, in Natal province, and admitting those students, a segregated minority medical school, if you will, and a young resident named Sidney Clark and his wife, Emily Clark, also a physician, um, launched the first study of African health that had been undertaken anywhere but by the University of Johannesburg in particular and discovered the appalling costs of mortality and morbidity uh, for South African children of color uh, as compared to whites. And for that reason, in the post immediate post-war era, uh, he was picked at a time when South Africa came very close to having universal health care coverage and there was a window of opportunity. Sydney and Emily Clark were the pioneers of community-oriented primary health care and uh, the idea that uh, medicine could be an instrument of social change, or so it seemed to me. And they were funded in part by the Rockefeller Foundation and 
the Rockefeller Foundation had uh, a great social epidemiologist, John Grant, that were supporting the carts at their flagship health center uh, in Poela in the Tao province, a Zulu tribal reserve, so-called. And uh, I had been well after being <coughs> barred from medical school by the American Medical Association. <coughs> Uh, gotten into Western Reserve Medical School in Cleveland and I read about John Grant sent me some articles about the carts and I decided if social medicine was real anywhere it was real there and I ought to go look at it and I scrambled all of my senior year vacation time and elective time and whatever and went to South Africa and worked in their rural health center and their in a Zulu tribal reserve and their urban health center in an urban uh, public housing project in Durban and knew that that was what I wanted to do in life. But I meanwhile had to learn to be a doctor, and a resident, and do a postdoc in human rights and social science. And it didn't surface until the preparation for Freedom Summer in the summer of 1964. And a group of us from around the country in anticipation of that started an organization called the Medical Committee for Human Rights with the goal of bringing as many physicians, dentists, medical students, nurses, social workers, all kinds of health, helping people to the protection, protection of indigenous health people, uh, SNCC workers, CORE workers, SCLC workers, in that whole venture in uh, health care and protection. Um, and it happened, and we did, and it was important. And then afterwards, we kind of reached uh, a follow-up meeting with all those civil worker folks saying, what do we do now? And for the first time, I thought about Poela and Lamontville and community health centers and said this is what a modern community health center is this is what we experience why don't we do it here and everybody ran around the room and contributed ideas and I had recruited a partner Count Gibson the chair of preventive medicine at Tufts Medical School a native Georgian who turned out to be one of the very first people in the United States medical profession to protest the Tuskegee syphilis experiments and brought him to Mississippi for Freedom Summer where his Georgia, ac Georgia accent got deeper every day <laughs> and uh, was really useful it confused the hell out of the cops. Uh, and, At the end of that meeting of the Delta Ministry of the National Council of Churches in follow-up, we got grounded in Atlanta and Count Gibson said, if you can find the money, Tufts will sponsor it. And the next month I went off to this brand new agency, the OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity, the so-called War on Poverty, and met with one of my heroes, Sandy Kravitz, the head of research and development. And I spent three hours with him telling him what a community health center is and why it should be part of their program. And they didn't even have a mandate for health, but he said we can squeeze it in under research and development. 
<clears throat> and then he asked me how much money did I want and I was getting chicken and I said well how about thirty thousand dollars for uh, a uh, trial project and uh, exploratory trial project that's what you do when you play chicken and he said no you can't have it I said why not he said you got to take three hundred thousand and do it now everybody needs to hear that once in their life <laughs> I'm never going to be this long-winded in any other answer I <laughs> But that was the tipping point uh, for deciding that we could fashion a new instrument of social change uh, and make medicine and medical care in this new institutional form rooted in communities staffed by people from communities, sponsored by people from communities, all the things that are represented by so many different people in this room uh, was uh, where the future lay. And uh, I owe almost all of that to Sydney and Emily Clark and my time in South Africa in 1957. And uh, it is the shared vision of all the people in this room and so many other health centers, community health centers, that I have visited in the interim. And I have never looked back and never regretted any bit of it. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Jack. You moved pretty quickly through the 40s, 50s, and early 60s. But I, and, and I think we'll get to, you know, Mount Bayou and your experience there. Yeah. But before that, um, I think as we look at a picture of you and uh, John Hatch uh, in the, what was the, the outline of the Mount Bayou Health Center, um, <clears throat> there's one moment I think that's important for folks to appreciate, and that is <clears throat> you and Count Gibson's involvement in, in the uh, Freedom March in Selma. When you went to Selma, and with the Rev led by the Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, were there on that bloody Sunday yeah. uh, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Tell us a little about that. Well, it really was another turning point. Uh, I flew down there on behalf of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which had um, been around all through the summer of 64. This was April of 65. And uh, arrived shortly after uh, the bloody assault on peaceful marchers from SNCC in the main and core uh, setting out across the bridge. Uh, men, women, and children trampled on by horses, beaten with batons by the sheriff's people, and state troopers and uh, the Selma police. Uh, and uh, ABC, the American Broadcast, <laughs> that were was filming it. This was even before videos, videos, and rushed the film to New York and put it on the air for more than an hour that night. Uh, and uh, that resulted in two things: the high mark in a way of spontaneous integration in the United States. Ten thousand people from all over the country came to Selma, just spontaneously, having to be there, having to protest, having to have discovered what the South was like. Uh, 
and more than any other thing, it gave us the Voting Rights Act. What happened was that from the next morning I flew to Atlanta uh, to meet Dr. King and we had made a commitment, we, Medical Committee for Human Rights, had made a commitment that we would keep a physician within 10 feet of him the whole time that he was in Selma because we thought he was at such risk. Uh, and flew with him to Montgomery and uh, there was a safe house at uh, Reverend Woods' house in uh, Selma and I sat in the corner while Andy Young and Dr. King and the SNCC people and uh, the core people and all of the more militant civil rights folks who had been in Selma for two years doing all uh, the organizing work uh, had their disagreements with Dr. King and tried to thresh it out that night and I sat in the corner and listened to it. it was, for those of you who may have seen the movie, that was pretty accurate about Selma and that meeting and the disagreements and what became known as Turnaround Tuesday uh, of praying but not uh, broaching the line of a federal injunction. Uh, the SNCC people didn't appreciate uh, the resource that King had, Dr. King had with his relationship uh, with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and uh, that was a second tipping point, uh, in a sense, for that kind of involvement. And what we did when I went to see Sandy Kravitz and OEO is, without realizing it, replicate Palala, rural, tribal reserve uh, in the Delta, Bolivar County, uh, Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta, and rec replicate the public housing project in Durban in a public housing project in Boston because we knew we would be bitterly opposed in Mississippi and, uh, and that in addition to that, two sets of people were gonna scream at us uh, the white power structure of Mississippi, including its medical branches, and people in Boston, poor people in Boston, that would rightly complain that what the hell were we doing 1,500 miles away in Mississippi when they were hurting on our doorstep? And so uh, we replicated Durban as well by taking on Columbia Point, a public housing project in Boston and somehow made it real. I have to add, when Sandy Kravitz said, you gotta take 300,000, I had no idea what this was all gonna cost. So I went back, I'm no fool, and uh, sat down and figured out a real budget for these two health centers, and came in and asked for 1,200,000, <laughs> a little more than he had thought about. And I said, but we got it, uh, and so those were real. And part of, nobody had any dream then that this would take off in the way that, did, that it did. And there would be this community health center and other community health centers all across the country, migrant health centers, public health health centers, rural, urban, high school, all of the varieties of forms as they have taken off and become this great institution. And in fact, and I'll stop with this answer, uh, an international one, there are now community health centers in, what is it, 
142 nations in an international federation of community health centers existing in all different kinds of national health care systems and uh, fitting themselves into it. So you are part, all of you here, in an, what has become an international effort and it is of course at root and branch an institution for equity in health care but also uh, in my view an institution for social change. Ask me another, Dan. And I'll... <laughs> well, you sort of blew through three different ones here, but, but that's good. We got yeah. the story going out there. I, I, I think, Jack, uh, two, two other items that bear mention. One is that what made Mount Bayou, what made Boston, what made those first community health centers different from the rest of the healthcare system is that they focus not only on the medical needs of the people coming in the door, but also on the non-medical needs as they affected the health and well-being of the community. And you had a couple of interesting experiences with a backhoe and, uh, and what have you, uh, addressing some of those social determinants of health because you recognized early on that if all you did was deal with the medical problems that presented themselves, you were just putting band-aids on. Yep. So how did you convince the feds to allow you to do that and actually support you by allowing you to use that funding for that? Well, uh, it, it wasn't easy, but it was easy. Uh, uh, once we really got to it, I had recruited this brilliant community organizer, John Hatz, originally from the Arkansas Delta and then Kentucky, um, this director of community relations at the Boston Housing Authority, and because of Columbia Point Housing Project, the grant had to circulate through them. Uh, and. Uh, he saw it, he had this big senior job, the highest ranking person of color at the Boston Housing Authority, and he called me up and wanted to know if all this other jobs were taken yet, and you know, we had to hire a soul, and he came in and we talked, and I recognized, uh, in fact, what a brilliant person he was, and he went and explored Bolivar County for us. We looked at 10 southern states and all the data and John lived in plantation shacks. He disappeared. I was, got very nervous. And he came back after about six weeks and I said, my God, John, what did you do? And he said, well, I picked cotton for two weeks and I lived in shacks with the poor people of northern Bolivar County. And of course, what had happened uh, is that the plantation system had collapsed. One double row cotton picking machine replaced about a hundred sharecroppers. You had crop dusting planes instead of chopping weeds uh, to get rid of uh, the weeds and other growth. People were 80% unemployed almost overnight because of this mechanization. People were trying to shoot squirrels and gather pecan nuts in order to feed their kids. And Dan is of course absolutely right. Um, medical care was important, but the term social determinants of health hadn't even been invented yet, but it was right in front of our eyes. Let me give an example. Um, we did a very careful health survey of the 14,000 black people in North Bolivar County, and one of the surprising things uh, was the degree of fetal loss, miscarriage, fetal wastage, and at first I thought, 
And it was way beyond uh, the data for people of color uh, across the country. Uh, more than 50% of the births weren't in hospital for those people. A lot were by granny midwives. I thought maybe all of that had something to do with it. And then I realized that people were living in these eroding plantation shacks and the porch steps had rotted away and people, women, pregnant women, were jumping off the porch two feet to hop onto the ground because there were no steps. And that was why, and then crawling back up 20 times a day uh, to get back into the facility. And that's how we started an environmental unit that rebuilt the steps and rebuilt the roof and uh, rebuilt all of the insulation that was needed uh, uh, to intervene. And what happened, to tell the story that uh, Dan wants me to tell, is uh, <laughs> that uh, we were we were supported in part by the Ford Foundation. We had developed this environmental unit to do uh, all of this rehabbing things that it could do. Uh, we had money coming from the Ford. The next thing we did was start writing prescriptions for food. And uh, Wherever we saw uh, a dehydrated kid with infectious disease from drinking water from a drainage ditch that was supplied by a surface privy that was leaking. So we dug wells and we built uh, protected water supplies and we built sanitary privies and wherever we saw a kid with that kind of infection weighing less than it did at birth uh, and close to death uh, from that dehydration and infection um, we wrote a prescription for food for all the kids in the family because we knew we couldn't feed just one kid the sick kid, the near-death kid, and let all the other children, four or five usually, uh, stand around a salivator watch. Um, and every town in our target area of northern Bolivar County um, had a black part of town. Every black part of town had a grocery store, black grocery store, and uh, every black grocery store arranged with us to fill those prescriptions that we wrote for meat, vegetables, clean water if necessary, uh, fruit, uh, all the components of a real diet. And we paid for it out of the pharmacy budget at the health center. And the governor heard about it, writing prescriptions for food and filling them in effect for free to the family and decided that Soviet communism had indeed arrived in Mississippi <laughs> uh, and screamed at OEO and OEO came and screamed at me and sent somebody down from Washington and screamed at me and said how can you do what you're doing, giving away, in effect, food for free and charging it to a pharmacy budget. And I said, what's wrong with that? And he said, a pharmacy is for drugs, for the treatment of disease. And I said, the last time I looked in my medical textbook, the best therapy for malnutrition was food. <laughs> and he went away because he couldn't think of anything to say back to that. And the way it turned out, 
ultimately, the OEO helped fund us for starting a 600-acre cooperative farm funded through the Federation of Southern Cooperative Farms and growing thousands of tons of vegetables and high protein, high protein coin, corn and other squash and melons and everything you can think of uh, and using OEO money uh, and helping us to repair those steps that were causing all those women to miscarry and to fix their housing and helping us to build wells and intervene in the things that were indeed making people sick. And yes, our bread and butter as community health centers is pre providing good and comprehensive medical care to people who need it on the principle that no one is ever turned away regardless of their means. But beyond that, I think always to keep in mind that we have to help that community deal with these external determinants of poverty and disease and suffering uh, in the ways that infect their day-to-day -day lives just as much as health or illness and that remains uh, as Dan has already quoted me uh, you know it's possible to lose your eyesight but maintain your vision and I hope that this remains in part a vision of everybody connected with human health center with community health centers end of lecture <laughs> <laughs>
made this happen by your years of work. I've called them in a couple of inscriptions that uh, I wrote today and some old books, Comrades in Arms, and that's what you are, and I applaud you <laughs> for the work that you have done. Well, we carry the torch forward, right? <laughs> but you were the one who lit the torch, Jack. Well, uh, is this on? Yes. 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 <laughs> So, well, thank you, Dan, for that wonderful recognition and all the support and friendship um, you've given to uh, Westside Family Healthcare and to me personally as a friend over so many years. So honored to have you here. And uh, we're very fortunate to have our National Association of Community Health Centers and you in DC uh, taking care of us and guiding us um, through, our, through our, our work. So, and thank you, Dr. Geiger, for taking the time to come to Delaware today. It is an, an incredible to listen to your stories. I think, you know, if we had the time, we would go on and on and on. Um, but uh, we are, are all truly honored by your presence. And we're not done with the awards. Um, so before we close uh, today's um, uh, event, um, I want to uh, offer, um, a token of our appreciation to you, Dr. Geiger, and for the first time in Westside's history, we have created a unique award that um, we will share with recognizing leaders in the community health field with a significant commitment to community health and whose involvement, service, and contributions to the improvement of uh, this field is note noteworthy and exceptional. And this award is in your honor, Dr. Geiger. We're calling it the Dr. H. Jack Geiger True North Visionary Award. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're giving it to you today. as one's orienting point that helps you stay on track as a leader and is derived from the most deeply held beliefs and values and principles you lead by. And Dr. Geiger, you exemplify the true north for our community health centers and for me personally for over the last 28 years. And um, I am distinctly honored on behalf of the board and staff of Westside Family Healthcare to uh, honor you with this award. Well, I thank you so much. I mean, the great pleasure of visiting community health centers on their anniversaries uh, is meeting the folks like you in this auditorium uh, that have made this happen. Um, you know, this is your 30th. It's my 92nd. <laughs> and I couldn't be happier. I'm going to finish with not only my thanks to all of you, but by telling you one story that I promised Dan I would tell and that I started on earlier. Uh, when we started the farm co-op, on the grounds that here we were sitting on the richest land in the United States and we could provide an opportunity to grow their own food in the system that they invented and ran, work, working in the fields for four dollars a day in cash and six bucks in produce, uh, and picking the staff and picking the farm manager, picking the CIO, CEO, and all the rest. And uh, the story I wanted to tell is that uh, the folks starting the farm co-op, mostly John Hatch's work, a parallel organization to the 10 local community health centers and the overall overarching North Bolivar County Health and Civic Improvement Association that for years received and ran the grant for the health center uh, from the OEO and later from uh, HEW. Uh, the people that were doing 
the farm co-op came to me and said, uh, we understand that you're a city boy and don't have a good grasp of these things, but if we're going to plant any crops, uh, we need at least four 40 horsepower tractors tomorrow morning. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't get done. Uh, and I said, okay, we're just turning in the new grant. I know the money from the Ford Foundation will be coming. Uh, when it does, we'll repay the grant, so it's all legal. <laughs> but just go ahead and put the tractors in the capital equipment section. They never even look at that at all. <laughs> <laughs> So they put it in the capital equipment section, four 40 horsepower tractors. And of course, that was the year that OEO looked at it. <laughs> and it turned out to be right in the middle of the obstetrical supplies. <laughs> and I got this kind of cold call from OEO saying they're really interested in hearing more about the deliveries we were planning. <laughs> So, again, I want to thank uh, Christiana Care and um, Bettina for, your, for bringing, bringing Dr. Jack here and Jane for driving Dr. Jack here, uh, Janice for uh, being a great partner in community health. Dan, thank you for coming from D.C. to our lovely town and um, I want to thank everyone in the audience um, very warmed uh, very much warmed my heart to see so many friends and supporters who came out today so thank you and uh, we will stick around a little bit for pictures and maybe um, Dr. Geiger might um, shake a few hands if you like and uh, but we do need to come out of the room uh, in about 20 minutes I think so uh, again thank you for coming I think we were a great success. What do you think, Dr. Geiger? Uh, my pleasure. Uh,